New Zealand was the only country in the world that put prohibition to the vote every year at that time, so it was quite unique. But in that year, uh, the abortion lobby stepped in and they wanted a referendum on abortion. And so they basically urged people to, to vote uh, prohibition as a sign of an abortion uh, question. And so the jump, the, the vote jumped that year from 19, from I think I've forgotten, but I think around 13 or 14 percent to something close to 30 percent that year. And so that revitalized this you know, And there were, there were two groups. There was the Women's Christian Temperance Union and the, the New Zealand Temperance Alliance. And they campaigned uh, for a year, and we followed it across that year, and we, you know, and we ended up making John Mackay directed. We ended up making this film that followed these people who were, you know, wowsers or whatever we would call them or called them in those days, as they tried to do God's work. They were fighting the good fight. When we started filming, you know, it was at the time, as I said, it's the days of film. And we needed lights. We needed, you know, and so the lawyers turned up and they weren't happy that we had all these lights filming around the place. And they turned up with sunglasses and and it just we thought, this is never gonna work. And the judge just looked really grumpy and I thought, this is this is this is never gonna work. And on day three we were taken out, or the inquiry was taken out uh, to the simulator at Air New Zealand at the airport. And we were kept in a room and separated from the others. And um, we, were, we didn't know, we thought, this is a disaster. We're not getting what we need to do. And I saw Mr. the judge kept being kind of escorted back. And I thought, I've got to go up to him. And as a young reporter in Dunedin years before, I'd been ripped to shreds by a judge by, for approaching him outside the, the office, you know, the protocol was, and I thought, I'm risking everything by going up to this judge. But I did. And uh, he said, uh, in New Zealand, don't want you to film this next little bit. But he said, but I can't see too many problems with it, so you just come with me. And we went and we filmed it. And that was, a, that was an indication, I guess, of um, what he was like. And uh, uh, that said, I would never have believed his turn of phrase when the orchestrated litany of lies came out, because that was just that just uh, blew everybody away at the time. That was a live uh, event, and so we had done some pre-filming, but largely uh, we had uh, Paul Holmes was in the studio at Avalon with a whole lot of studio guests. Mark Sainsbury was with Sered in uh, in Nepal, and it was going to be a live thing and. It was a nightmare because we thought we need something. Anyway, we'd, we'd structured the, the broadcast so that we told the story and everything was supposed to happen. But at key points, we were supposed to interview Sered. And um, we thought with the satellite coverage, we will never be able to guarantee that it will, it will hold up for those two hours. So we thought we need to record the, the rehearsal that we do two days before. So at least we've got something to cut away to if it all goes wrong. And uh, we did, we set up for the rehearsal and the rehearsal was a disaster. We just didn't get anything. We covered about 20% of what we needed to do. And we just thought, I just thought as producer, we have no, we have no, uh, we have no means of covering the thing. So Sir Ed was, was uh, sick at that time. We had to persuade him to come out of a sick bed to come and do some key standby interviews so that at least we had something to cut away to. The day of the broadcast happened. I think it was one of the most stressful days of my life. And um, literally about 20 minutes before we were due to go on air, the phone system to Nepal went down. So we had satellite coverage, but we couldn't talk to the team. So I thought, thank goodness we've got something uh, in, in place. We've, we've, got a broad, we've, got a, we've got a show. Uh, but literally seconds before we were due to go on air, the phone system came up again and everything ran and it ran smoothly. Yeah, so, but I think that was one of the most stressful days of my life, I think. Lemming Aid was an idea that I loved when it, it was the second film that I produced with Grant. And when he told me that story, I just thought, this is fantastic. And yeah, the, I mean, the idea of somebody trying to stop Lemmings from committing suicide and jumping off a cliff is just, well, I, I hadn't heard it before, and I thought, that's great. 
And so, yes, it was filmed um, at Tatahi Bay, just north of uh, Auckland, uh, of Wellington. It was uh, filmed around New Year's Day on some of the most windy thing that we've ever come across. So what you, what you see on the film was whatever, it was a major problem for sound and for getting everything right and it was bloody tiring doing it all. But no, it was a, it was a, it was a great thing because it was a wonderful idea, simple idea, small idea, but an idea that everybody could grasp. Grant had made uh, two shorts which had won prize, you know, special jury prizes at Cannes, uh, I think two years in a row. So he was kind of primed and set up for his first feature, and uh, this is the, you know, this is what he wanted to do. So you know, it was a black comedy. Um, it, w it was the same as as the other things that he had done, and he brought the lessons that he'd learnt on the other films uh, to that. Um, and it all went ahead. It was a uh, co-production between New Zealand and Germany. Uh, and uh, yes, it all it all it all happened. Um, now, as it, as things turned out, it wasn't uh, the, the the audience didn't like it quite as much as they liked his short films, which is a, a shame because I've I've always liked it. But uh, that's kind of that's kind of what happened. Uh, so it just kind of shows you that sometimes sometimes the magic happens, and sometimes it just doesn't quite strike quite right. Lost in Translation was uh, the idea of Mike King, the comedian Mike King, who I who I knew, and uh, he he had this idea and he pitched it to me, and I had no idea about this thing. And what he said was the nine treaty sheets, and I, you know, I'm a boy from Gore. I went I went to school. I went to I didn't know there were nine uh, treaty sheets. And he said, let's do a story where we follow the story or the the journey of each of those sheets and tell a story of who signed and who didn't sign. And I thought that was just the most fantastic thing I'd, I'd heard, and that's, that's what we did. And we ended up talking to the descendants of those who, you know, because it's not that long ago. And uh, a lot of those people, you know, had memories and stories and things that, that we can add. And so I, I loved the idea of telling the story through the, through the descendants. You know, other people have, have kind of come up and used that concept since, but I, th I think that, you know, it was, it was a great thing to have, to have done. It was just the most incredible story that I'd never come across before. So we ended up making a documentary for, um, for TV One, uh, and we called Marnie's Story, yellow, yellow for Hermaphrodites, Marnie's Story, and that was her personal story. And she was nervous, you know, it was, she was revealing stuff about herself. But the response was amazing, um, I think for her personally, but also it's, it's had a big impact you know, around the world. That, that film um, has, has gone around the world and I think you know, it's not too much of an exaggeration to say that Marnie is probably one of the, or probably the best known uh, intersex person in the world. Uh, and she's an incredible, you know, treasure of a person, someone with courage and um, yeah, I just, Marnie is, I think, is, is, is a hero. Most of the filming we did for Bloodlines was in Auckland, but we had two days filming in Dunedin and we went down and we filmed various scenes. And um, what happened was that uh, Colin Bauer, the, the, the doctor who, um, who went to jail, uh, tried it at the end of the process to convince people that he had cancer and he shaved his head. He went to South America, to uh, South Africa, and he came back and he shaved, he shaved his head um, and uh, told everybody he was dying of, of cancer. When we cast the film, one of the first things I said to Mark is, Mark, you're going to have to shave your head and you're going to have to shave your eyebrows. So he was quite happy to shave his head, but he didn't want to shave his eyebrows, but he did. Cut forward to the filming in Dunedin, and uh, we're on the street outside Dunedin Hospital, and uh, I introduce his character to the um, to the the real doctor who was the who was the man who who got to the truth, and the real doctor Andrew looked at Mark with his bald head and no eyebrows, and said, "Why did you save your eyebrows?" 
And Mark said, because he told me to, pointing to me. And uh, Andrew, the, the doctor, said, but, Andrew, but, but Colin Bauer never shaved his eyebrows. That was what we could never understand. He shaved his head. He never shaved his eyebrows. So it was never convincing that he had cancer. And Mark grabbed me by the throat and said, you made me shave my eyebrows. <laughs>